Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we introduced the idea of pickups. Imagine these are actually evenly spaced. So looking from the side of the pickup, you might have a series of pole pieces, and then you have a bunch of wire that's wrapped around the pole pieces, looped a whole bunch of times, Imagine that is more artistically done than I just did. And looking from the top, you might see the six pole pieces for the string, and it would look something like this. Then we would wrap the wire around something like this. And you would be wrapping this thousands of times, lots and lots of wraps of very tiny wire. Now, you might have something like a Jazz Master pickup where the pole pieces themselves are magnets. And then the guitar strings that run over the magnets become magnetized. So the strings themselves are ferromagnetic. They're not magnetic in and of themselves, but the strings become magnetized when they're in the presence of a magnetic field. Or you might have other pickups, like in a typical Stratocaster or Telecaster pickup, where the pole pieces themselves are made of something ferromagnetic, but they're not magnets in and of themselves, but there's a bar magnet placed underneath the pickup and then those pole pieces become magnetized in the presence of that bar magnet. And then you will also have things like Dan Electro pickups that are much less fancy. Those are basically just bar magnets with coil wrapped around them, something like this. So there's all kinds of variations. So whatever the magnet is, whatever the pole pieces are, however this works, I'm going to imagine that there's a voltage that's induced on the coil and I'm going to indicate that by a function v of t. And I'm going to put in series with it an R coil that represents the resistance of the coil and an L coil that represents the inductance of the coil. And what we're going to see is that although manufacturers will often report this resistance measurement because it's easy to determine and it's a rough measure of how hot the coil is, that's a bit of a red herring. The really interesting parameter is the inductance, although manufacturers don't report that as often. I'm also going to include a capacitance here, that C coil. And so this is basically kind of a parasitic effect. It's modeling all of this combined interwinding capacitance. This is not really something that the pickup designer has a lot of control over. The pickup designer does have control over R and L, and you build your pickup, and C is sort of whatever you get. Now, that's the model for the pickup itself. This is hooked to a bunch of other stuff, like the volume control or the tone control on your guitar, like the cable that's going to your amplifier, or whatever the first effects pedal that you're plugging into is, or whatever. So we have to extend this a bit and say, put some other capacitance here associated with the cable capacitance that you're using to hook to the amp. If it's a short cable, this isn't very much. If it's 100 feet of cable, that might matter. So I'm going to call that C load. And let me put an R load here. And what this is usually representing is the input impedance of the amplifier or the first effects device in your chain. And again, notice that I've left out your volume control and your tone controls on your guitar. So the voltage is usually described by something called Linz's Law that looks a little something like this. There's a minus sign here, usually depending on what conventions are used. I'm not going to really worry about that. N, where N is the number of turns of the coil, and then we have d phi over dt, where this derivative indicates the change in flux. Now, I'm not going to worry about the details of this here. The designer has picked some sort of magnet. They've picked some sort of configuration of how that magnet is placed relative to the coil and relative to the strings. I'm going to start the discussion here in terms of V. So we're assuming V is created, and then we're seeing how that voltage translates to whatever the input of our next element of our guitar signal chain is. Now, the resistance... That's something the designer has some control over. There's the particular material you use in the wire. That has a parameter called the resistivity. That's indicated by a parameter rho. And this is multiplied by the length of the wire divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. People most often use copper wire, although I have seen some 
rather absurdly priced pickups that use silver wire. The area has to do with the gauge of the wire that you're using, and the length is something that you, of course, choose yourself. That length is proportional to this parameter in the number of turns. Now, the inductance, that's very interesting. That's usually given by a formula like this. You have the permeability mu that has to do with your magnetic core times n squared a over l. Now, this L is actually different than this L, so let me actually put a little subscript. I'm going to indicate that this is the length of the wire, and this is the length of the pull piece. So A is the cross-sectional area of the pull piece. Now, this is a super approximate formula in terms of its application to guitar pickups, because this is the formula people use for, say, an iron core inductor where you're tightly wrapping the wire around the core. But of course, in a guitar pickup, you have this plastic bobbin sometimes, you also have a bunch of air, so it's a little more complicated. The main point I want to make with this formula is that while the voltage and the resistance rise proportional to N, the inductance rises proportional to a factor of N squared. So by just changing the length of the wire, the designer can change these parameters but that length is just one degree of freedom, and it affects these parameters differently. I want to start by trying to get some intuition about what the resistance of the coil does in terms of how it interacts with the load. So let's start with a low frequency analysis. Essentially, I'm going to ask, what is the transfer function of the system at DC? And of course, we're not really interested in DC signals, but this is sort of an approximation to what's happening for, say, bass notes. And this kind of approximation lets us simplify some things. So at low frequencies, these capacitors are effectively open circuits, and the inductor is effectively a short circuit. So I'm going to call this V out over here, this voltage. And it's a little bit confusing. I'm thinking about it as the output of the pickup. But of course, this is the input to the amplifier or whatever else is coming up in the chain. So this is just a standard voltage divider. The output voltage, I'm not going to bother writing down the dependence on T, is going to equal the voltage coming from the core of the pickup. And then I'll have R load in the numerator and R load plus R coil in the denominator. Before I move on, I want to emphasize again, I'm not including volume and tone controls here. In general, one of the main effects can be not just the load of the amplifier, but the load of this amplifier in parallel with your volume control resistance. That will change depending on where you put the volume control. Okay, let's do another analysis. Here I'm going to assume that the load resistance is infinite, so I'm essentially taking it out of the circuit. And just to make my life easier, let's let R equal R coil and L equal L coil, just so I don't have to keep writing that subscript. And let's let C be the parallel combination of the coil capacitance and the load capacitance. All right, so let's find the Laplace domain transfer function. We'll have a voltage divider where we're dividing the voltage over the impedance associated with the capacitor, so that's 1 over SC, over the series impedance, so I'll have R plus LS plus 1 over SC. Okay, so let me multiply the numerator and the denominator here by S to clear out the S, and let me also divide by L. So I'll have 1 over LC in the numerator, and in the denominator I'll have S squared, plus R over LS plus 1 over LC. So this is basically the transfer function of a two-pole low-pass filter. And I would encourage you to go check out an old lecture from my ECE 3084 class where I talked about second-order transfer functions and also a similar lecture from my analog circuits for music synthesis class. So I'm going to equate this with a particular parameterized form that has an omega n squared in the numerator. Omega n stands for a natural frequency, 
then I'll have S squared plus omega n over q, S plus omega n squared, where the q is what's known as a quality factor. So if I were to equate the numerators, I would wind up with something like omega n squared equals one over LC. So omega n is equal to one over square root of LC. So in terms of the natural frequency, if you say keep everything else the same and change the number of windings, changing the number of windings changes L. So if you were to say increase the number of windings, that is going to increase the inductance in terms of the square of the number of windings. We have a square root here, so that's going to drop this natural frequency. And the capacitance is also going to change with the number of windings, but it's kind of hard to predict how it changes. And I think the main effect is going to be the change in the inductance. If you disagree with me on that, feel free to leave a comment below. Let's have an interesting civil discussion. And everything affects everything else on a guitar. So all of these effects interact. It's a question of how much. And let's see, if I equate the constants in front of the S terms here, I would have R over L equals omega N over Q. Omega N is one over square root of LC. So I'll have something like one over square root of LC times Q. So let's see, I could have Q on the left-hand side by moving Q up here. And then if I move L up to the top of the right-hand side, I would have something like a square root of L in the numerator. And then I'll have a C in the denominator of the square root. And then if I move the R over here, then I have one over R. So my natural frequency has L and C in it. My quality factor has L, C, but also an R in it. This Q parameter, this quality factor, is related to another parameter called zeta, which is 1 over 2Q, and zeta is called a damping ratio. So it's just a reparameterization. It's much more common in the control theory literature. Q is more commonly used in RF engineering and audio engineering. Here we're talking about audio, so we're going to use Q. In 3084, you're probably most used to seeing zeta. Okay, so something interesting about Q. If Q is less than or equal to 1 over square root of 2, so that's around 0 0.707, then you have a nice, well-behaved magnitude frequency response. So the magnitude of the frequency response is a monotonically decreasing function. Nice, well-behaved, but boring. Now, if Q, on the other hand, is bigger than 1 over square root of 2, then you actually get a resonance bump in the frequency response right before it starts to drop. Now, where is this frequency bump? This is at a frequency I'm going to call omega r. Oh, I should have mentioned earlier, all of the omegas here indicate a frequency in radians per second. You would want to divide by 2 pi to get it in hertz. So what about omega r? Omega r is equal to omega n times square root of 1 minus 1 over 2q. And notice that for large q, omega r is pretty close to omega n, but it's going to be less than omega n, so omega n might be up here somewhere. So basically the system wants to resonate at its natural frequency, but the existence of metaphorical friction in the system created by this R here prevents the system from having as much fun as it wants to. And remember, C was a combination of the inherent coil capacitance of the pickup and the load capacitance of the cable connecting the pickup to your amplifier. So as you change that cable, that changes the C, that changes this Q, and it changes this omega N, and it changes this omega R. Oh, I should also mention, Q basically relates to the width of this peak here and the height of the peak. So the higher Q is, the narrower and taller the peak, and the lower Q is, the wider and shorter the peak. And also remember, I made an assumption here that this load resistance was infinite. 
If it's not infinite, that changes all of this analysis. If I start to include volume controls and tone controls and other effects, it can get a lot more complicated. All of this analysis is just to try to get a feel for the main effect of the parameters of the pickup.